Okay. Well, I guess I can start with introduction. Uh, again, welcome everyone to this joint uh, seminar for the Applied and Interdisciplinary Mathematics Program at the Michigan Institute for Computational Discovery and Engineering. And it is my pleasure today to uh, introduce Miguel Moyers Gonzalez, um, an associate professor of mathematics and statistics at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand. So yes, it's Saturday for him. So. Ah, first, thank you for giving a seminar on a Saturday morning. And uh, Miguel uh, completed his bachelor in science at the uh, Institute, uh, Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México in Mexico City, and then his master's and PhD in the Department of Mathematics at the University of British Columbia. Then he was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Montreal, I think, doing um, applications or as, uh, of uh, blood flow. And then as uh, he was a um, lecturer at the University of Durham, and finally he moved to New Zealand. Uh, so he's been everywhere. His, um, his primary research interest is in the, in the mathematical analysis and, um, and numerical solution of complex Lewis flows. And, well, and I guess uh, he's, he's, uh, he's done applications from, uh, well, a lot of application complex fluids, right? Uh, mainly with plastic fluids. And today he's gonna talk to us about inferring physical properties and topographical features from free surface flow data that I really have to do with um, ice thickness, but I let him go ahead. So thank you, Miguel, again, for being here. And Thank you, Mariana, for the nice introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for um, being here and um, inviting me to, to talk into, into, the, into the seminar. Um, I should say that um, I've known Mariana since uh, year one of our, our bachelor's degree. So, so it's been Mariana and Rafa um, and Rafael. Uh, so yeah, we, we've, we've known each other for a long time now. Um, Yes, uh, like Mariana said, uh, my, my interests are mainly uh, in non-Newtonian uh, fluids uh, and applications for non-Newtonian fluids. I've been doing uh, rheology and uh, numerics for, for, for complex fluids for a long, long time. And um, this part of, of, uh, of, of my research, uh, it, it's very much in, in, into, into that space uh, because we, we want to, to infer uh, either rheological properties or, uh, or topographical uh, features, but from uh, non-Newtonian fluids mainly. Uh, I should say that this work is um, it's, uh, in collaboration with uh, Elizabeth Mark George and Phil Wilson in, in, in the Department of um, in the School of Math and Stats here in Canterbury, and um, Mathieu Selye, he's in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, when I say collaboration, I should actually say that it's, uh, it's uh, Liz's uh, uh, PhD uh, research. She's, she's uh, my, my PhD student, but uh, all the results are, are, are were done by her. So, so it's, it's, it's mainly her work. Okay, so before I start with the with the with the with the talk, uh, a little bit of uh, where I live. Uh, as Mariana said, uh, I live in the future, so it's uh, 8 a.m. on a Saturday here, and this is New Zealand. So probably everyone has seen a, a, a map of New Zealand by now because well, this uh, we were in the news because of COVID, and we didn't have COVID for a long time in in in, in the three islands. So it's not two, only two islands; it's the North Island, the South Island, and Stewart Island. And Christchurch, where I live, it's in here in the peninsula, the Banks Peninsula. It's a um, massive old volcano that made, um, uh, erupted like a million years ago, and now we have very very beautiful uh, landscape thanks to that. And it's a fertile line because of the uh, land because of that. Um, so Christchurch is here. So I, I, I've been here for 13 years now. Um, everyone, when, when, when I say that I live in New Zealand, everyone said, oh, well, you live on the other side of the world. So for everyone, I live on the other side of the, of the world. And when I, when I talk to people that are not from this part of the Southern Hemisphere, uh, I like to show this, this map. Uh, and if you see here, Christchurch is one of the only cities that actually has an antipode 
in the northern hemisphere and it's a Coruña in Spain. So yeah, I'm far away from you guys, but uh, I'm not on the other side of the world. So you must be around here and well, it's still not on the other side of, of the world. And um, well, we're here. So we don't fit in this part. And in many maps, uh, you will find that uh, people forget to put us in the map. So, uh, but we're, we're there. Okay, so now to some, uh, some, some of the work that I, uh, we've been doing for the past uh, couple of years. Uh, so I'm going to, to give an introduction or, or a motivation of why, um, why uh, we're doing this and some um, previous work, obviously people have been, have been tackling this problem uh, for, for a while now. Uh, I'm going to present uh, the equations we are going to, um, to to study and uh, and how we describe uh, this is mainly going to be on uh, glaciers and ice. So what rheological model we use for ice? Uh, we um, simplify our problem through the shallow ice approximation, and then I'm going to well, it's it's the result. Right? So 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 we are going to infer some some topographical and some physical properties of the problem through uh, an, an optimal control technique. And I'm going to show you some results and, and conclude. So why, why we thought this is important? It's because we want to model geophysical flows. And sometimes this requires information which is difficult to measure and it's poorly quantified. So for example, in lava flow, we have another, with Mathieu, we have another project on lava flow. And if you want to, to actually predict uh, how, how lava moves, you need the physical property and the rheological properties of lava, and they are difficult to measure. I mean, putting lava in, in a rheometer is, 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 is it's difficult. So we want to know, can we infer rheological properties from, uh, from data that we get from, from the field or experiments? And it's just, it can be the same for landslides or mud flow uh, avalanches and, and I'm going to concentrate right now on glaciers. So through uh, field data or, or um, um, yeah, through field data, can we uh, see what is happening underneath the, the, the glaciers or predict the thickness of the glaciers? Uh, and that's the main, the main, the main uh, problem that we're going to tackle. So why do we do this? Uh, well, as we know, because of climate uh, change, uh, it, there's uh, an increased demand for accurate uh, climate models. If we're going to predict uh, uh, how, how the climate is going to change in the, in the foreseeable future, we need uh, good, accurate, uh, good uh, climate models. And a key component of this is the cryosphere. And uh, we need uh, values for land ice thickness, right? And this, this picture shows uh, glacial locations across the globe. So um, there's a lot of data that we could be uh, uh, getting. So reconstructing the bedrock of glaciers and ice sheets is a huge undertaking. Uh, it took over 60 years to generate bedrock topography, the map of Antarctica. And that's met, uh, bed map uh, two, that's, that's available, uh, that's uh, data that it's, um, this picture comes from uh, the consortium, uh, consortium bed map, uh, it's bed top topography of the Antarctic. Uh, I think it's an, well, it's a multinational uh, undertaking. So it's, it's, it's massive. Uh, the resolution obviously is coarse. I mean, map Antarctica is, is difficult, right? And measuring the bedrock elevation is much harder than measuring free surface velocity. So we can measure, uh, the, the topography of the of the ice, so the surface topography, and we can measure. Well, they can measure. I shouldn't say me. I, I, I'm. I don't do field work, so uh, they can measure the surface uh, topography and the surface velocity. So our question is: Can can we reconstruct uh, bedrock from the information at the ice upper surface? So using. Uh, surface topography and surface velocity, can we do something to, to, to see what is happening underneath? And, and, the, main, uh, and, the, and the main things that we, we, we we're going to try to reconstruct is uh, the, top, uh, the uh, basal topography and 
if the um, ice or the or the glaciers slip. So so if we have some some basal slip. So those are the main two things we're going to concentrate on on this project. So from surface topography and surface velocity, can we get uh, uh, to, uh, topography uh, of the of the basal um, and at, at the base and sleep. So what people have been doing, uh, I mean, this problem, as you can imagine, has been has been tackling for for a, lo a, a long time now. So in the past, uh, I think the some of the first um, tries to 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 get this information were do uh, were done by um, using Krieging. So that's just an interpolation. You see the weighted average of the known points in the neighborhood of the unknown, right? So it's uh, talking to my my friends in 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 the stats group. I I don't I'm I'm more of a deterministic person. Um, it's yeah, it's just linear regression uh, regression with some information. Um, um, my friend was telling me that you use um, covariance matrix that has information about the the spatial uh, structure and uh, and that's that's how you 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 create your weights and you do linear regression. So it was interpolation, and then people started to 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 build more sophisticated uh, models. Uh, uh, some of them are, are, are this idea of of having a, a, a conservation model. So. So you can have, if you have uh, the velocity, uh, the information of the velocity of the surface, you can uh, empirically form fluxes of mass of ice at one point and another. And then, well, you just write your, your kinetic equation or your kinematic equation. And through that, you can, you can infer the thickness of the, of the, of the ice. And, and that's a popular technique that's still uh, in use now, so you can see Morlinghem and Farinotti have done that a lot. Uh, from that, uh, people started to use this idea of 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 of, of uh, optimal control. So you throw in more physics into the problem. So you model the ice with the proper rheological laws, and and from there you 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 use optimal control and you you invert the problem and you get you get the the things that you want to, from. So that's the that's 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 the way that we're going to attack the problem. Uh, I, I should say that uh, Petra uh, and their group uh, do a full three D steady uh, state. Uh, it's it's just a um, a matter of yeah even a philosophical matter. I mean, if you want to treat the problem fully three D or, or 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 simplify it and do two D uh, fully three D, well, as you can imagine, is is a nonlinear and very 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 large problem. So so it can be a huge undertaking. So what uh, the approach that we're going to take is simplify the three D into into uh, either one D or two D. Um, and we, uh, Blatter uh, did that, and, but they, they consider the full nonlinear problem and, and they use the topography as control. And uh, Monnier in, uh, I think he's in Toulouse, uh, he has um, uh, something similar. He has a reduced uncertainty GIA model. Um, and again, he's, he's, he, he uses the idea of this covariance matrix spatially uh, to, to treat uncertainty on, on, on the data. I should say that our approach is more deterministic. So we're smoothing, uh, I mean, we will assume that we can smooth um, our, our, uh, our data and, and use only the, 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 the optimal control without the uncertainty. Uh, this is work in progress, obviously, and, and, and we will like to, to extend afterwards. Uh, there are also well, if if you come from 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 the inverse problems uh, world, obviously there are several ways of attacking the problem. So you can use Bayesian techniques and machine learning techniques. We're we're, we're not doing that. I think Monnier in Toulouse is starting to use some machine learning techniques. So we start with, uh, uh, as, as I said, so we're going to take into account a little bit more of the physics of the problem. So we start with our conservation equations, obviously. Um, so if, if you haven't done uh, fluids uh, before, I think everyone has seen the, the, the Navier stocks, but uh, let's start from the beginning. So the conservation equations, I'm going to consider 
we're going to consider uh, this problem uh, is iso isothermal. I know that that's from the get-go controversial. It makes our life easier. And well, I, I know that right now is, is not the case. We're, we're losing, we're losing uh, glaciers, but um, we can, we can uh, assume that, yeah, more or less the temperature is uniform. Um, so it's an isothermal uh, problem and obviously it's, uh, it's incompressible, right? So, um, so the two equation, well, the, the equations that we're going to consider for the conservation loss is conservation of momentum and conservation of mass. Conservation of momentum is just second, uh, Newton seconds law is, well, it's force equals mass times acceleration. So the force is here and the acceleration here. And this one is just, uh, uh, um, we assume that uh, the, the, the fluid is incompressible, so, so no, no change in volume. So we have a solenoidal uh, velocity field. So as you can see in this, this equation, uh, we have the velocity field, we have pressure, we have the external body forces, and we have the stress. So the trick here now is to give a, a description of the material we want to, to study. And through that stress, we, we, we will find a relation between stress and velocity field to, 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 to do that, right? And that's when the rheologists come in and, and start to do their magic. So Newtonian fluid, if you consider that the Newtonian fluid, uh, the, the easiest or the simplest uh, constitutive equation is that the stress is proportional to the rate of strain. So this gamma dot is a tensor, is the symmetric part of the gradient of the velocity and measures how much the, 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 the material is deforming. So what this, this constitutive law is telling us is that you impose some force into the material and the deformation is proportional to that uh, force and the constant of proportionality is the viscosity. So, so that's what Newton did and, um, and um, and that's where you end up with the Navier-Stokes equations. If, if you consider the, uh, the, the Newtonian fluid, you end up with the Navier-Stokes equation. So we substitute tau into our previous uh, equation and you get the Navier-Stokes. You can non-dimensionalize and you end up with the famous Reynolds number. Reynolds number measures um, inertial forces over uh, viscous forces and, and uh, stresses, sorry. and uh, we're going to assume that our, uh, for, for, for ice, uh, viscous stresses dominate. So we will have what we call slow flow uh, or viscous flow. And this part can be um, disregarded. So what do we do for ice? Uh, obviously uh, ice is non-Newtonian. So we were, are going to take uh, Glenn and Nice law for ice. That's, that was developed, I think in the fifties. It's a little bit funny how, how, how to describe it. Uh, if you see in here, I was taking uh, more, the stress is a function of the rate of strain. In, in, in for Glenn's law, they do it the other way around. It's, it's just a matter of, of, of taste, I guess. So instead of having a, a viscosity, now instead of having a uh, um, um, non-linear viscosity or a, or a rate dependent, uh, rate of strain dependent viscosity, it, like it's, it's, it's usually non-Newtonian fluids, we have what we, we, we could call a fluidity. So fluidity is the reciprocal of the viscosity. So if the fluidity is very, very, very small, that means that your, 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 your fluid is very, very, very thick. Or, or very uh, viscous and the other way around. I mean, if the fluidity is going, goes to infinity, that means that your, your, your viscous is very, is non-viscous, right? So that's, that's, you can consider that as a nonlinear um, fluidity. Uh, this constant AT depends on temperature. As, as, as I said, we're going to consider um, constant. Uh, and just to give you an idea for ice, this A is on the order of 10 to the minus 17. So it's very, very, very small. So ice is very, very viscous in that. Thing. And um, if you do a little bit of the maths, uh, Glenn and Nice uh, uh, found that uh, a good law for ice is with N is equal to three. So you end up with a shear thinning fluid with coefficient one half. So if, if you're familiar with generalized uh, Newtonian fluids, uh, we have a, uh, 
we consider ice as a shear thinning fluid and, and the co coefficient is around uh, one, one half. And we're going to assume some kind of um, uh, friction law at, at, the, at, the, at the basal uh, uh, topography. And um, again, uh, it's going to be like a nonlinear uh, Navier kind of uh, law. And this beta is the one that we're going to try to to, to, to infer, so that beta can turn on and off. So it's going to be a parameter between zero and one. So we can, we can control how much uh, the, the ice is, 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 um, is sleeping. So, so this beta is one of the, 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 the things that we're interested in. Okay, so let's start modeling. So now we have our uh, conservation equations for ice. Uh, as I said, it's a nonlinear problem, 3D. So we want to, to, to start to make some, 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 some simplification. So as is, is, is uh, common in, in lubrication uh, uh, kind of, uh, we're going to, to, to follow the lubrication approach basically. So we're going to assume that our our uh, glacier is very long and thin, right? So we, we assume that, that uh, the, the height, uh, the scale for height is way, 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 way smaller than the scale for, for, the, for the length of the, of, the, of the glacier. So by doing that, we can depth average our equations and what we will end up with is with an evolution equation for the height or the surface, because the surface S is just H minus the bedrock, right? So that's, that's what S is. So if we know S and we know the bedrock, we can know how thick our, our, our um, glacier is. So that's, that's, that's the way forward uh, for the problem uh, forward. So if we can actually find an equation, an evolution equation for H, and we know the bedrock and we know the slip, well, we can we can we can infer the thickness of the of the of the glacier. So we do that again through the lubrication approach. We depth average across uh, Z, and we can get an, an well an average velocity. Uh, at the surface, and we can uh, get uh, an, an evolution equation for H. So that's that standard uh, uh, way of doing uh, these kind of problems and simplifying these problems. So we go from 3D to 2D, uh, and that saves a lot of uh, hassle. So the shallow ice approximation, if by doing that, the shallow ice approximation equations are, are, are these ones. So as I said, it's a follow. It's it's, it's a it's a evolution equation or a conservation equation for the for the height or for the thickness of the uh, of the of the glacier. And here, as you can see, I'm leaving my s in there, and I'm doing that in, on purpose because s is just h minus b. B is the the basal topography, but. Um, the, the thing is, is that we're not that concerned on on um, on um, on the uh, uh, on the forward problem, right? Because what the, the the information that we have is the surface, the surface uh, topography. So this is is going to be known, and the um, velocity. Okay, so through all these uh, simplifications, we can get an equation for the evolution of the thickness or, or the surface and an equation for the velocity. So if we, get, if we can get data from the field or synthetic data or whatever, if we can get data from, for S and for U, well, the point is, can we, get, can we recover H and beta? And if we recover H, well, we know S, we know H, we can infer the, the basal, the, uh, the, the bedrock, right? So, so that's the main point. Um, so that's, that's the, 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 the shallow ice approximation equations. F, it's, it's an accumulation function. So if you see here, this F can tell us the accumulation of snow on the, so it's accumulation and ablation. So it's, it's how much the, the, the glacier is, is growing in some parts because of snowfall 
and how much is, 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 is decreasing because of temperature or or no small or so so the ablation of the of the of the of the glacier so i think in these parts here and here this f is negative and here is positive right so so that's what is 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 is, is telling us that's given again that that's can that that can be from from uh from experiments and that's the 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 f that we're using for most of the uh here everything is dimensional uh, the first results I'm going to show you, uh, we didn't non-dimensionalize, the second results are, are non-dimensional, but uh, right now, um, this, this is the F that we use. Okay, so, as I said, this is the forwards problem. Uh, so if you know B and you know beta, you can get H. Now the problem, the, the, the question is, if I, if I know US and I know S, can I get uh, H and beta from it? So the first step will be use the information about the topography of the surface, so S, and write this as an, as an optimal control problem for the surface elevation in a domain omega in R2. So R2 is the X and Y direction. And we minimize this functional one S minus the observational data or the synthetic data. And we, well, we have this kind of tick on off regularization uh, for D star in H1. What's D star? And this is what we, that's, this is how we approach the, the model. We're linearizing our model. So we assume that what we want to recover is this part here, right? So this nonlinear diffusion um, equation. I know that H is one of the things that we want uh, we want to recover. That's going to be done in the second step. So we assume what if we have a, a non-isotropic uh, diffusion uh, coefficient? So D depends on 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 the spatial and on x and y. So we are uh, linearizing the problem. And we know, and we want to 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 control for uh, using that as a control to get S. So that's this D star. D star is that horrible nonlinear part. Okay. So that means that this problem is linear, and it's very easy to to to, to solve. And 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 by using the um, the 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 field data, we can control uh, through control. And this one, we can we can we can minimize this this function. So in the first step using the observation of S, we can get D star. Once we get D star, we want to construct or reconstruct H and beta. So that's the second part of the problem. And it's again, another control, uh, optimal control problem. So now we have, we have to minima, uh, minimize the, uh, the function now J with respect to D, U and H and beta. And we got, the star from the previous step, and now we're going to minimize this this um, this difference. We use the observation of uh, of the velocity, and we minimize this difference, and we control for h. And again, the this is like a Tikhonova regularization uh, um, type of, of of problem, and we are smoothing things out if, if we don't if we don't include this 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 part things get uh, it, they, they are not smooth i should say that alpha for this problem we set it at 10 to the minus 5 for all the all the results this one we we have to play our uh, alpha h we play more about uh, with that one and i will show you results for different values um so this 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 uh, minimization is subject to satisfying that idea of that the diffusion coefficient, it's it's the expression that that we have from the CI right, and the velocity again is 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 the expression that we got from 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 the model. Um, so those 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 two steps are 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 the ones that we're doing. One is a control for with a PDE, but it's linear, so it's very, very quick, very, very easy to solve. And this one is just well, it's non-linear, but it's algebraic, so it's it's very easy to solve too. So it's it's a quick pro it's, it's, it's a it's a quick process. So the first steps, uh, the, the the first um, uh, results I want to show you are one D. So we we just have everything in in one D. Uh, by the way, uh, I should say that to avoid the 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 inverse crime. 
we run all, uh, we, we produce uh, synthetic data on a very fine mesh and we reconstruct in a coarser mesh. So, so that's one of the ways that, uh, that you can avoid the inverse, uh, the, inverse uh, the inverse crime. And the other one is, is to put noise into your synthetic data. We do that for, for 1D, for 2D, Liz is working on that. So, so in 1D, we, we, were, we are um, we're setting um, certain topography and, 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 and sleep. And as you can see for 1D, this, this, this method works very, very, very well. We can reconstruct um, the, the surfaces in, in, in a very uh, accurate manner. Um, we have some problems at the boundaries. I think it, 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 was, uh, it's, it's, it was sort of to be expected that at the boundaries things, things start to, to break down. Uh, you have high gradients, you have H going to zero, for example, the height going to zero because it's, well, you, you touch the, the, the ground. So obviously uh, we know that the, this kind of lubric lubrication, uh, lubrication approaches at the, at the, at the edges uh, the the model breaks down, so so we we are not expecting to 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 get a great um, recovery there. But inside the domain is really really good. So that's for beta and for H. So this is for different topographies. So with uh, hills and, and valleys, if you want, and uh, beta to the slip at 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 the uh, at the middle of the domain is is really good. Uh, for one, the list did some 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 um, more uh, simulations and, and 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 she included some noise on the on the velocity data, and again the 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 recovery is 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 quite good for for inside the domain and and we were very happy with this. Um, now, uh, well, that was one D, so we can recover this in one D. So that that was a nice a nice. Um, test for, for, for our approach. Can we extend it to 2D? The answer is yes, but before, before I, I present you her results, I want to, 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 to stop for, for, for a bit and, and, and deviate from, from this idea of, 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 of glaciers and, and all that. Because you, you will see, see I mean, I, I want to give you the background of, of, of her first results because if not, they just look um, a little bit strange and, and say, why did you do that? Uh, and this is going back in, in, in time for, um, and, and my, my times as, 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 um, as a master's student. So as, as Mariana said, I, I, my main work on, on non-Newtonian fluids is, is viscoplasticity. And this is nothing to do with, with, with inversion or anything. It's just, just to give you a background of why, why we did what we do. Um, uh, and so I work with viscoplastic fluids, and we were uh, looking at, uh, at ideas of, 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 of uh, a viscoplastic fluid. I should say that it's, it's, it's a material that uh, unless you put enough force into it, the material does not deform, right? So it behaves like a solid. So examples of viscoplastic fluids are, for example, lava, uh, ketchup. So ketchup, if you even if you open your 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 bottle, sometimes it doesn't flow. And it's not because it's very thick; it's because it's a viscoplastic fluid. So it has this this uh, rheological property called the yield stress. So if you don't exceed, if the force does not exceed the yield stress, your material behaves like a solid. Well, well, well. Uh, that's what uh, that's one of the ways of modeling. So it become it, it behaves like a plastic. So that's why you have to tap. Very, very, very strongly your your um, your your bottle, so you break the yield stress, or you exceed the yield stress, and and the thing flows. So as you can imagine, when you're processing these kind of fluids, if your pipe, if the cross section of your pipe has very small corners or sharp corners or or, or small places, well, the fluid goes in there. Your forces are below the yield stress, and it gets stuck. So one of the problems is how much can uh, your material get stuck into these sharp corners, and what are the shape of those those uh, those stagnant regions, and many many things. So so when I was doing my my, my masters, we were looking at this problem, and and my supervisor said, oh, why don't you just uh, come up with a with a different kind of uh, cross section for the pipes because you're doing circles and squares and triangles and that's kind of boring. So, so Ian Frigard, my supervisor said, oh, we're in Canada, why don't you just try 
a maple leaf cross section. So I did a uh, viscoplastic fluid flowing through a pipe of of uh, of um, uh, with a cross section of a maple leaf, and as you can see. Well, the fluid gets stuck in the in the in the, in the leaves, right? So everyone got really excited about um, having a viscoplastic fluid flowing through a through a maple leaf. And uh, if you have, for example, your toothpaste uh, uh, um, a hole with a shape of a um, of a maple leaf, well, your toothpaste will get stuck into into the leaves. Anywho. I finished that, and when I came to New Zealand and I had a, a PhD student, he was looking at uh, developing new numerical methods to solve this problem of viscoplasticity faster. And we were trying to test uh, this with different, different uh, pipes of cross sections. And I was, uh, and I told a uh, team at that point, uh, well, we were in New Zealand, I did a maple leaf, what can we use in New Zealand to, 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 to have a, a fun uh, pipe with a with a funky uh, cross sectional area, and we were thinking about a silver fern or something like that. And he said, "No, no, 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 no. Why don't we do a kiwi?" So we did a pipe with a cross section of a kiwi. So if you have toothpaste with a cross section of a kiwi, well, you won't have a kiwi when you extrude it. You the pick gets stuck and the feet got stuck. So we done that, and then you see where this is going, right? So I was talking to Liz and I said, oh, okay, let's have some different topographies so we can recover them. So I just put some lots of bumps and, and torques and, and see, see what, what we can do. And this week she was thinking, okay, so I have a few uh, ups and downs in the, into the topography. So some, some hills and some, some uh, valleys, but uh, let's do a fun topography. So why don't I do? A kiwi topography. So she has a topography. So her bedrock is a hill with a shape of a kiwi. I should say that uh, she has no slip. So this is the topography that she wants to recover. So that's what. Uh, so everything here is flat, and in the middle of the of the domain, she has a small hill with the shape of a kiwi. And now we're going to use the technique that uh, I, I showed you, and we're going to try to recover that topography. So we put that into our technique, and the recovery is really, really, really good. If we don't have sleep, uh, this is H. The, the, re, the, the target is the, the mesh. So this, the, the target, this is H, and the target is the mesh, so the, the gray gray mesh and the recovered thickness is the, the full surface. So as you can see, it's it's almost perfect. I should say that if if we don't have sleep, uh, we can uh, cheat a little bit and we and she found a, a, a unique solution, uh, sorry, uh, an analytical solution and it comes from using these two equations. You can you can combine these two equations and you end up with a with a with an actual analytical solution for the for the for, for h without the, uh, if beta is equal to zero. Uh, and that's how we, we, we test that our 2D simulations are actually correct. We turn off sleep and we see if we recover with the, with the analytical solution. So, so just for fun, we have a topography with, uh, with a kiwi on it. So, so we can recover that, no sleep. Now let's go and do something a little bit more if you want uh, real, uh, and, and, and we have uh, now a topography with two hills and a valley between the two hills. So this is the, the topography. This is B, the bedrock. And slip, um, she tried some slip of, of, of the glacier around the, the, the big topography features and something in, in between. So as you can see, I mean, this is all very small. So it's 10, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.6, but we want to see if we can we can recover this more um, real world uh, topography, if you want. Uh, well, the answer is yes, we can recover, but we have to be uh, things get more more interesting and 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 things get more complicated. So. On top, I show you what happens if we don't re uh, regularize in the second step. So that alpha H, we're turning it off. So we just uh, uh, use 
say Newton's method to recover our our um, height h, and it's well, it's not good enough, right? So we 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 don't get a, a smooth uh, uh, recovery. We have lots of problems on the on the boundaries, and we're very far away from from the from the true true um, true data. If we start to regularize, and in the bottom we put uh, a little bit of smoothness on h, the recovery is quite decent, and we are more or less on the same ballpark as as other other techniques. Uh, we have a smooth recovery for the bedrock and for the for the for the slip. You will you will ask me, well, but Miguel, in in general, the bedrock won't be smooth. I I know. Uh, but we can play around with alpha H uh, to, to recover something that it has a little bit more peaks, right? But uh, without this tick-on of regularization, it's, it's not good enough. So we can recover. Uh, you, will, you will notice here that when we over, um, um, when we over specify the, the, the slip, uh, the way that the method is, is reacting is we under specify the, the, the 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 bedrock so the bedrock here will not under specify so when we we over specify the slip uh, the bedrock reacts and 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 creates a a, um, a depression which makes sense so you have to 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 to, to recover the, the the surface right so if, if 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 you predict that your 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 ice is slipping too much well uh, the way to counter counteract that is to have a depression on the bedrock. And uh, if we are underneath, so if we don't have enough sleep, we start to get a turf in, in, into the bedrock. So the problem is very difficult because these things are interconnected because uh, the, the, the sleep obviously is, is, is a boundary condition and we want to recover the boundary. So, so these things are very, very sensitive and very connected to each other. So it's, it's a difficult problem. So. Um, this is the, the, the height that we recover. It's not, uh, you will say that it's not as, as good as the key we want. Yeah, it's not, but uh, we're not that far away from, from, from uh, and, mo and mostly inside the domain, we're not that far away from the actual, actual height. Uh, we have problems again at the boundary. So we're thinking about what to do with that. If, if we have the, 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 the topographical features and the slip, far away from the boundaries maybe we can do a better job so so artificially making our our um, uh, glacier larger if you want and, and try to, to to recover localized uh, topography is, is, is a good idea so that's what she's trying to do now and this is the relative error of the for the height of the recovered um, uh, uh, and the recovered uh, uh, height and as you can see, I mean, inside the domain is, is quite good. We're, we're around 6%, 3 6%. The boundaries is where we have the problem. So we're around 20% off. And that's a common feature in this problem. And we have seen from other, other, other techniques that that's, that's a common feature. But uh, inside, we're very happy that we can recover uh, uh, to that, that accuracy. I show this, this, this plot of, of the... Of the velocity because uh, when the velocity is equal to zero, well, it, it gets really, really small. We, we start to get these kind of uh, 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 problems. Uh, they, our, 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 um, our, our model breaks down. So, so when, when the velocity is very small, well, we, ha we, we have problems. And again, when, when, when H goes to zero, uh, we have, we have uh, um, Singularity. So, so we have to be careful with that, and maybe, maybe, as I said, try to to make our our domain a little bit bigger. So, I will conclude now. Uh, we we use a linear optimal control framework. So, we were linearizing our problem, and then in the second step, we're recovering from that uh, uh, using the 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 rheological uh, or the physical properties of the of the fluid to actually bring back the nonlinearities, and we can infer topography and basal, basal slipping for uh, glacier flow. Uh, the method works well for synthetic data. Now the next step would be try to use some field data, so bed map, 
too that it's uh, available. It's it's very difficult to get um, uh, glacier uh, field data from uh, around the world. Uh, they are they are well. It's difficult to get, so so they are not freely available to to everyone to use. And we want to extend this method to other rheologies and geophysical flows. So so the the, the point is not just uh, do these kind of uh, techniques for um, for glacier flow. So what happens if you have other kind of, uh, of rheologies, lava, for example, can we get uh, rheological properties from surface and, and, and surface velocity of, of lava flow using this kind of idea? We linearize the problem and then we recover from it. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. And if you have uh, any question, please, you can uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask. Or if you don't want to unmute yourself, you can actually put it in the chat, then we can read it. But while anybody asked, oh, Robert, go ahead. Yes, yes, thank you, Miguel. Um, we heard recently some talk about uh, using machine learning uh, to learn a differential equation. And, yes. uh, and um, for example, if you don't know the rheology uh, precisely, uh, has that kind of approach uh, been used in this area uh, to pick out the terms in the equation and the right coefficients? That's a very good question. I haven't seen, I mean, the things that I've seen from uh, uh, machine learning kind of uh, uh, approach is well, you you train your 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 network from the field data and predict the ice thickness. So you don't you don't even propose a, a, a rheological method. Uh, I've seen this the the work um, uh, of of inferring uh, how. Well, yeah, you, you could say the rheological loss or how, how your PDE looks like uh, using this machine learning thing. I think it's very, very interesting. And uh, I have a, a, actually a colleague, uh, Julio de la Riva, in, 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 my, in, my, in my school that it's looking at these kind of problems. He's more into the phylogenetics uh, approach, but he's trying to bring me into into this world and uh, i'm really interested to see if we can we can do some some work with rheology so i don't think it's been done in in, in glaciers but um i will be very interested to, to to take a look yeah thank you so they haven't done any what well, it would there be enough data available to compute this you know to do the, the uh identify the system through machine learning uh <laughs> that, that, that's that, very good. I, think I think that, that the, be the, the, the bed right? map the bed map too it's it's it, it's it's a huge amount of data i don't i, I don't come from the, the 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 machine learning world so i don't know how much do you need to train these 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 things so so i wouldn't be able to 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 answer that uh, that question but um there's some data so so and i know that some people are using uh um, uh, Monier is is trying to combine these machine learning techniques with with uh, this um, kind of uh, uh, optimal control things to, to 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 make things better. But I, I, I in that that part I, I said I'm 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 not I'm not involved, so so I'm not I wouldn't be able to answer questions about that. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, uh... Yeah, Miguel. Uh, so your forward solver, uh, how uh, how long does it take? Uh... Uh, we use uh, I, I put that we use uh, Phoenix. Uh, the forward solver. Uh, how many how many nodes she's she's using? It, it takes the forward solver takes like uh, I don't know in, in a few minutes to 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 create. We, we're not doing a massive domain. Uh, it's I think the whole the whole thing to 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 create the synthetic data and then to 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 recover for for one one problem. I think the one that she told me that the Kiwi one took like ten minutes to do the whole thing. So it's not that that that. I see. And do you see any limitations of using Phoenix in this setting? Um. 
to tell you the truth, we haven't seen any 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 limitations. And and the nice thing about Phoenix is that connects very very nicely with Dolphin at joints. So they talk well. They were developed by by the same team. So so Dolphin at joint is the one that does the optimization. So so once you have in the Phoenix uh, uh, the, when when you get all the all the all the all the data in, in in a Phoenix format, it's very easy to use the the optimization toolbox from from Dolphin at joint. So I haven't seen for synthetic data. I haven't seen any limitations at all. It's really really good. All right, thanks. Yeah. One more. I, I think I remember uh, a while ago uh, work by Andrea Bertozzi and uh, Lou Kondich on uh, lubrication. And I, I think I remember them, uh, you know, the moving contact line and the boundary condition, uh, H goes to zero. I think they add like a, a, a thin non-zero layer. And uh, yes. is that uh, something that you've explored? Yeah, uh, we, we haven't explored that. Uh, now we knew that 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 the problem on the boundary. So that's why we were not that concerned in, in a way that uh, that the boundaries uh, uh, were, were, uh, were a problem. Another, uh, yeah, a, a way to do it is to you just wet the, the whole surface and, and then you don't, you don't have that problem. So, so that's one thing that we thought about uh, doing. Another way that you can do is to extend to um, a kind of a, 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 another, sort of lubrication approach it's called the shallow water uh, approximation so you you keep some some of the uh, initial terms and and then the the, the the equations are more consistent apparently I haven't uh, done it so so those are, are avenues to, to to explore yes definitely yeah okay thank you again and I'm guessing those like the difference between the ice sheet and the lava would be the ice moves much more slowly, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, but at the end, this is just a matter of time scales and and and, uh, and 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 rheology. So, so so what we like about this approach is that uh, this D star comes mm -hmm. from your physics. So once you recover the D star from the observation, well, the second step is well, we have a different 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 expression for this dH beta. Or, or whatever you want to do. So, so, so this h to the fourth and h cubed and all this comes from the, for setting the rheology. So if you want to change the rheology, you, these exponents are going to be different, right? So you can recover okay. the, the exponents too and, and, and whatever you want to, to, to do. So, so this, this diffusion, the, the diffusion coefficient is the one that has information about your, your, your material. So that's, that's, that's a neat thing. Okay. And it's, it's just a, an algebraic one. Okay. Um, any other question from questions from the audience? Okay. Yes. So, oh, you have one more, Robert. Yes. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not oh. fam very familiar with uh, Phoenix. Does it provide an adaptive mesh capability? It has. It has some. Yeah. Yeah. But you didn't. Uh, did you? We didn't. Did we did. We didn't. Um, uh, did any 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 it would it would have been nice to do the the the, the adaptivity around the kiwi but uh, we don't want to do that uh, because in a way i guess you're following the the the, the a topograph an unknown topography so we thought it could be mm -hmm. cheating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay Thank you. But yeah, I guess I guess you can you can combine the the, the afterwards. So so you can do one recovery, see more or less where the features are, and maybe uh, mm -hmm. have some kind of uh, adaptivity and, and 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 have some interpolation of the data. I don't know. Yeah, that, that mm -hmm. that's that's a good good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's the, very good. A good idea. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. It seems that. There are no more questions, so please help me thanking Miguel again, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. And just a reminder for the students that are here: don't forget to sign up uh, for the form to record your uh, record that you assisted to the uh, seminar. Thanks again. Thank you, thank very you, Robert. Much.